Hello and welcome to Basic Medical Sciences. Uh, if this is your first time here, please make sure you hit the subscribe button so that you won't miss any of our videos because we will be uploading videos almost each and every day. Right, uh, so uh, in the previous videos, we already uh, went through uh, the, the introduction to general virology and we also did the viral life cycle right so uh make sure you wa you watch those videos uh before watching this video okay right uh so in this video we are going to talk about the viral pathogenicity we'll also talk about the uh, cause of viral infection uh the host defense mechanisms and we'll have an overview uh, of the diagnostics all right uh viral pathogenicity now on viral pathogenicity uh, the mechanism by which viruses cause infection to the host cell include uh, the following number one a cytolysis or cytolysis right so this is possible uh, because uh, viral replication results in destruction of host cells and thereby releasing the viruses right and a typical example of um, this cytolysis is uh, by hep simplex virus so uh hep, hep, hep simplex um it's uh the cytolysis triggers the the what the typical formation of um of the blisters right and here i indicated here there is um a virus and here is a is a host cell which was uh formerly healed but now is under attack right so um, the virus got its way into the host cell and the and start to replicate right and after that then there is um a cell death or lysis right releasing the new viruses looking for the next target right so the second mechanism is uh, through the immunopathological um, host reactions right so this is possible because the cellular immune response to the invading virus is triggered by cytotoxic T cells right uh, this this lead to uh, destruction of infected cells and a typical example is uh, HBV uh, hepatitis B virus uh, but this virus is not uh, cytopathogenic right and this is the mechanism highlighted here this cell is the infected host cell right and inside it has um, the the viral antigen right so the infected cell it will present this foreign antigen on its membrane right through uh, specific receptors right so when the cytotoxic, cytotoxic t cell comes right when it will realize that there is a foreign uh, antigen there so this cell should be should be killed right so how does it do this firstly it releases um a perforins right so perforins they make holes around the what around the uh, the host cell which is infected then it will release granzymes granzymes will get in and activate uh apoptosis pathway right and then the cell will die uh moving on uh to the third and final uh, mechanism uh here we, there is a transfer of genetic material but this is specifically in uh in bacteria because if you remember where bacteriophages bacteriophages are actually like um like special kind of viruses which uh infect uh the bacteria right so uh, they may transfer virulence factors, for example, exotoxins, and uh, in this case, we have a uh, uh, scarlet fever toxin by what? By Streptococcus pyogenes, right? After after phage transduction. So here is what happens: the bacteria we have first, let's just say, is a strep Streptococcus pyogenes. A bacteriophage attacked this cell, injected its DNA uh, or its genetic material right then there is a reorientation so when packaging because this these phages they have to go out so when they package they can include some parts of uh 
the bacterial DNA, right? So what will happen is like by mistake they can take or a, a, a virulent, um, a virulent part here, and then inject it to to the cell to the, or to the bacteria which was not uh, producing the scarlet fever initially. So this one will start to what will start to produce uh, a scarlet fever toxin, right? Okay. Uh, now let's look at the cause of viral infection, right? So when the virus uh, uh, attacks the, the the cells, right? They can be an abortive reaction. So abortive uh, simply means like no, there is no replication, right? And they, thereby there is no cell damage, right? Nothing will happen. And then uh, in terms of time, it can be acute or, or chronic. Acute, this simply means like when uh, the your immune system uh, manages to clear and eliminate the virus uh, like within a short piece of time. Right, chronic, yes, but um, at a later stage. Right, uh, then another uh, uh, very important thing is persistence. Right, uh, when we when we say the infection is persistent, now we can talk about like um, a latent phase. Right, the latent phase is uh, during this phase the virus is actually inactive and the, it's not replicate replicating. Right. So the virus remains dominant in infected cells, and a simple example is VZV, uh, varicella zoster virus, uh, which causes uh, what chickenpox, right? So after the disease resolves, right, the virus becomes dominant in the dorsal root ganglia of the nerves, and upon uh, upon reactivation, they begin to uh, to replicate, causing a reinfection here, also called uh, shingles. Moving on, uh, after, okay, I, I just talk about uh, the latent phase. Then the second thing is uh, productive. If we say there is a productive inter interaction, what it simply means is that uh, here viral replication occurs with infection. Uh, I mean, like, so domain infection is actually with few or no signs of infection, right? And lastly, there is transforming. Uh, this is when uh, the virus may or may not replicate, but triggers uh, what a malignant transformation. For example, EBV or HPV. This one is a human papilloma virus. Okay, moving on. So, how does our body protect us uh, from the virus infection? Right. Uh, the body has multiple mechanisms, right, to inactivate and totally eliminate the virus. This is possible by innate immune system and adaptive immune system. Okay, let's talk about innate immune system first. Uh, the physical, biological, and uh, chemical defense mechanism, they play, they, they, they play a very significant role. And these are just few examples. Uh, keratinocytes. So these cells called keratinocytes, they are keratin producing cells. Uh, they are found like uh, even on our skin, right? They're actually uh, impermeable to viruses, right? Secondly, there is mucociliary clearance of the respiratory tract, also known as mucociliary escalator. And what happens here is the cilia will beat upwards uh, expelling uh, the virus and uh, transporting it back to the throat right so this will be either either for swallowing but swallowing will only work for uh, acid um, acid lab bio viruses okay what are those acid lab bio viruses okay stay tuned you know about them All right uh, there's also production of acid and uh, viral replication inhibitors by the commensal organisms, right? So this is another another way, right? And above that, our bodies also, they have uh, this mechanism of RNA interference, but this will only work against RNA viruses, uh, right? And we also have natural killer cells. And remember, natural killer cells, they are 
still part of innate immune response and not forgetting the complement system right so these are a group of uh, proteins synthesized by the liver they have uh, different names from c1 through c9 all right above that the uh, interferons right interferons uh, we have interferons alpha and beta all right they are produced by infected cells uh, they trigger damage and death of infected cells they inhibit uh, viral replication and protein synthesis how do they do this firstly uh, they uh, the initiate synthesis or activation of RNA and the nucleases, right? So these uh, RNA and the nucleases, they cleave the phosphodiester bonds between the nucleotides. Then the second mechanism is through phosphorylation of protein kinases, right? So this phosphorylation will lead to inactivation of, of uh, eukaryotic initiation factor 2, right? So if, if this factor is inactive it means uh, protein synthesis is inhibited but the most important thing is that the interferon can also be used to treat hepatitis B and hepatitis C okay uh, now we've been talking about innate immune response now let's talk about adaptive immune response all right and here you need to remember two important things uh, immunoglobulins or antibodies and T cells. So here I only indicated uh, about uh, antibodies or immunoglobulins, right? So they are produced by plasma cells. So where do they come from? These plasma cells, they're actually like uh, activated B cells. So if there is uh, activation of B cells, it will transform into plasma cell and release the what? the antibodies right and also it can form uh, memory cells right so that when the virus come again it will be known and it will be attacked early early all right uh, now let's talk about uh, diagnosis all right so the most important diagnostic tool in virology uh, okay tools actually because we have serological testing and nucleic acid detection right uh, so this is uh, this helps to identify specific uh, localized increase in viral production so it means different biological material should be analyzed and compared and we have an example of blood or cerebrospinal fluid in case of meningitis all right so uh, if we talk about antibody detection right in, in diagnosis we have a very important uh, test known as the hemagglutination inhibition test right so this test is used in the diagnosis of viral infections uh, of we have influenza mumps and measles these are just examples right how is it possible these viruses they contain uh, here if you look here they have a hemagglutinin right these are actually glycoproteins right so they have the ability to bind and agglutinate the rbcs right and then look see what happens all right here you have the rbcs you have the rbcs alone there is no virus uh, there is no antibody so there is no interaction no reaction so there is no hemolysis or hemagglutination right uh, in the second um, second case, you have the virus and the RBCs, right? So these were, as I said, the, the, the virus, they have hemagglutinin. So they will be clumping and there is hemagglutination. And in this case, this is the actually like the base of the previous test of hemagglutination inhibition, right? So here you have the virus, you have the antibody, which is specific to this virus. And also we have what the RBCs. So what happens is there is a formation of uh, complexes, immune complexes, uh, between the virus and the antibodies here. So what it means that there is no way uh, these uh, RBCs can interact with the virus because the uh, the receptors are not there. Okay. 
right so this is uh, what I just explained how it is done right so the patient's serum is added to infected cells right so if the antibodies are present in the serum what happens is like a progression of uh, infection in the cells is inhibited thus neutralization of viruses yeah and as I said before hemagglutination will not be observed okay so this is just an explanation I can pause if you want to read through okay and um, lastly we let's talk about ELISA enzyme linked immunosorbent assay right uh, this method or uh, direct immune immunofluorescence right this is also used uh, like on the basis of anti antibodies right okay uh, now let's talk about the polymerase chain reaction this one is used to detect the actual DNA or RNA of the virus so in this case uh, in for example in HIV infection and HCV it's used like as a what for quantitative detection of viral load right and we also have um, a viral isolation virological method so this is used as a like a prerequisite for resistance testing okay for example in HIV right uh, above that there are some time consuming um, uh, methods like cell culture electron microscopy but they are not typically uh, used uh, for clinical diagnosis oh thank you so much thank you for watching uh, please if you like this video just click the like button leave a comment in the comment section and don't forget to subscribe thank you so much